Okay, falling foreclosure filings fuel false housing hype hope narrative. Elevated distress through 2021. That is a lot of alliteration right there. I had to think a long time to get through all that and create that. Anyway, welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, other episode of As the Housing Market Turns Insurance. Today is the 20th of October. Things just moving right along here. I'm Randy Patrick, your host, putting the realism back in real estate. And again, we got the housing hype hopefuls versus the forbearance crash bros. That's how I... I look at this right now. Uh, so anyway, we'll talk about what's going on in the in the uh, the marketplace here, and I do think things are interesting because guess what happened? Adam Data Solutions puts out their Q3. We'll call it you know foreclosure. Um, you know it's their it's their basically their foreclosure report. It happens and they do it on a quarterly basis. They summarize where things are at. You know for the third quarter of the year they do again they do this on a quarterly basis and the big news is what foreclosure starts are down you can certainly see the drop in foreclosure starts all right um completed foreclosures so homes that are either sold at auction or going to reos they're down as well too big time year over year and basically it boils down to this that the high level takeaways for you know um, the report that came out here in September is one in every 14,000 properties had a foreclosure filing across the US states with the highest foreclosure rates in September were South Carolina Florida Illinois Alabama and Maine and again it just depends on what's going on with the court system and the county clerk and what's being filed by lenders etc um, 5,000 U.S. properties started the foreclosure process in September, uh, down 11% from the previous month and down 80% from a year ago. Lenders completed the foreclosure process on 2,000 properties in September, down 1% from the previous month and 83% from a year ago. So what you're going to see out in the mainstream media is you're going to see the fact that foreclosure filings are down, foreclosure activity is down, everything is great in housing land. So what that's going to do is, as, as I said in my title, that gives people a false narrative and a false hope that the housing market is fabulous. So right now, there are reasons why the foreclosure fines are down uh, on a month over month and certainly over a year over year basis. And we'll get into, we're going to get into that in a second here. All right. Um, however, you know, the, the trend, like I say, the, the normal trend across the country is to see foreclosure filings and activity down. But here are 10 major metros, again, from Adam Data Solutions. And I'll put the link to this in the, um, you know, the information section of the video where foreclosure starts are on the rise and foreclosure starts are basically filings, list pendants, notice the default, whatever. It basically is the starting process. The lender goes, okay, I'm going to take the property back due to non-payment. So we have Kansas City, Missouri that was up, uh, the New New York, Newark, New Jersey area, Pennsylvania area, Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Norfolk Newport News, Indianapolis area, Richmond, Virginia area, Detroit, uh, Wayne, Dearborn, Michigan, Chicago, Napierville, Elgin, Illinois, Nashville, uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee area, Charlotte, Concord, Gastonia, North Carolina, and Cleveland area of Ohio. So this basically, these are the top 10 locations where we saw an increase in activity in Q3. All right. So you can certainly see that, you know, basically, um, you know, when you take a look at like a New York, New Jersey area, you know, over, it looks like about maybe, you know, 10,050 properties were, were filed a foreclosure filing, which doesn't seem like much considering the population base there, but because of the slowdowns, um, the moratorium that are out there, a uh, moratoria, uh, the fact that lenders really aren't filing because they go, well, if I file and I pursue, we can't do anything about it anyway. We can't usually take it to sale uh, until the moratoria is, is lifted in various states and locations. That'll be probably in the new year. So they're not really filing a heck of a lot. However, we're seeing some states relaxing some of their, um, their moratoria laws. Uh, we see some states that are actually saying, hey, um, you know, we're not going to renew our, our local moratorium. Uh, we're going to sort of go with the CDC moratorium, which really, if you, take a, if you actually get into that, it's un unconstitutional. Uh, it's tough to enforce. It's more interpretive from, I guess, the local judge and court system, clerk, whatever. Uh, and it really 
deals more with the renter issues as opposed to foreclosure issues here. All right. But just again, you can see that certain parts of the country are, are, are starting to, we'll call it flow a bit more to more filings. Now, also, we talk about you know, the average time to foreclose jumps 21% from last quarter. Well, yeah, it, it does make sense because, again, it's uh, everything is slowed down now. The court systems, the lenders, everybody is processing stuff on a slower basis, either due to job cuts, restrictions, shutdowns, working from home, whatever. So the whole foreclosure process from start to finish really is either on hold, in limbo, slow down, just kind of inching along, meandering along. So don't don't get too excited thinking that this is going to be great and life is life is good because we're seeing a lack of foreclosure. What we're actually not seeing, but it's there, is a stacking up of a heck of a lot of foreclosure volume that'll be coming in the next few months. Uh, it says here, states the longest average foreclosure timelines in Q3 2020 were Hawaii, 1,700 days, New Jersey, 1,500 days, New York, 1,400 days, Florida, 1,200 days, and Washington, 1,100 days. Um, to what they mean, this is from start to finish. So this basically is the day it was the foreclosure was filed until the day it was sold at the auction. That's the, the average timeline for a foreclosure. Some will go faster, some will go uh, slower. Depends on the situation, the lender, the homeowner, whether they're defending it or not. There's a lot of, lot of things go into that uh, perspective. Also, it depends on how the court system and the foreclosure process works for that state. These states here are typically what's called a ju under a judicial foreclosure process, which is more lengthy, has more court iterations, etc. States with the shortest average foreclosure timelines are Virginia, 180 days, Minnesota, 208 days, Alaska, 213 days, West Virginia, 236 days, and Texas, 244 days. Again, from notice of default to when it goes to sale, these states are not judicial. They're called non-judicial states, or maybe trustee states, and it's a different process. So you can see it, it certainly cuts the time from, you know, <laughs> a high of 1,700 days in Hawaii to a low of 180 days. So we're, we're like, you know, um, how many days are we looking at here? Like five years to six months. That's a pretty big difference, right? Anyway, the point is, and I can explain this if you want more information, but the point is, um, this is what's going on in the industry right now. This is what you're going to see based on the state's um, situation. Of course, the average is 830 days uh, right now. Now, before the COVID shutdown and slowdowns and all this, it's affecting the court process. I was personally looking at a lot of cases here in my uh, area in Florida, and I can tell you that the overall foreclosure process is speeding up because there's no point now. There's no point to drag it out. The lenders want to take the property back or get it sold at auction because they don't look at it as a loss anymore. They look at it as going, how can we make money and move this property, get our cash back, keep our costs down, et cetera, without holding costs and you know securitization, things like that. So it's changing people. Uh, you know, a lot, we're not going to see these long foreclosure timelines as time goes on. Um, just of note, um, they actually have a, a chart here at U.S. foreclosure market data by state. And I guess what they're looking at is really the, you know, it's it's the ratio. It's one in every, you know, X number of, of housing units of foreclosure rate. So you take a look at the top, you got the rate, state name, total properties, is filings, and that's the that's the rate. One in every X housing units of foreclosure, the foreclosure rate. So, and this is, the states are in alphabetical order, so we don't actually have this in numeric order here. But you can see California is 10th, you know, in the state, in the country for foreclosure rates, Delaware is number five, Florida, number seven. So of course, Florida's always always up there. Uh, next, we've got um, Illinois, always one of the leaders at number two, Maine at number six, Maryland, number eight. So it's, again, that's the foreclosure rate, like a per capita rate. Um, we go to the next slide here. What do we got? I've got New Jersey at number four, Ohio at number nine. South Carolina, for whatever reason, South Carolina ha has creeped up and has, I guess you could say, um, you know, out of the third quarter, the highest foreclosure rate uh, per housing units that are going across the U.S., which is very interesting. Oh, I missed New Mexico, number three. So it's funny because, you know, I look at going, we, we have our typical states, which are usually, you know, the Floridas of the world, the New York areas, the New Jersey. We get that eastern seaboard like Maryland, Delaware, somewhere in there. Uh, we'll always have Illinois. And then every so often we get an outlier like a South Carolina or something else that sort of pops in. Look at New Mexico's number three. So maybe the actual filings aren't huge as far as the volume. But when you take a look at, 
you know, filings per housing unit, they're, they're increasing. So that tells you something uh, about the situation across the country is that, yes, we're, you know, the, the typical foreclosure giants are always going to be there. They're going to ebb and flow. And then you get these outliers that kind of, you know, poke their head in, which is kind of interesting here. Um, there's nothing out of the top 10 the last little bit here. So they, they rank this, and I'll put a link again in the information section of the video. But you can see, oh, Vermont, you know, yeah, I mean, Vermont number 50, like not much goes on up there. So really, you know, when you take a look at, you know, everything is different across the country. It's based on volume, distress, the um, foreclosure process, and how the state handles foreclosure filings as well too, to determine where things are at in all this. All right. Now, um, why am I talking about this? Well, because here's the deal, okay, is that we see some increases in some foreclosure filings now. I'm personally seeing more homes getting slated for auction sales going on as well. And, you know, the problem, though, is that with this, you know, the, I call this, this, you know, housing hype narrative is the fact that everything is good, everything is great. Well, part of the housing hype narrative is the fact that we don't have distressed properties that are hitting the marketplace, either adding inventory or, or adding to lower, like to pull the value, the average value down. So reason being, well, look, U.S. housing inventory hits a 13-year low, all right? So basically, it's 2020, so we're going back into 2007 saying there hasn't been this low, much, this low of inventory until that point in time, right? So just before the, and funny enough, where, when was that? Just as the housing uh, bubble was, was starting to crash, before we probably had the same, you know, if it's a 13 year low, uh, you know, we're, if you go back in time, the inventory could have been at low as well too before everything kind of broke loose, the previous housing crisis. So the whole point is that we have this potential inventory sitting there that's not touchable and not available to normal retail home buyers and nothing is being done by it. Yet the narrative of, hey, housing market is great, properties are going up, interest rates are good, go buy, your buying power is huge, go buy that property, all right? So this is why I always say this is somewhat of a false narrative or an artificial, the artificial housing market control here. And how do we know that? Well, borrowers missed $19.4 billion in third quarter mortgage payments. So, you know, we have a ton of forbearance. We have people that are in delinquent and not in forbearance, not paying their mortgages. And if we're not talking about that or focusing on that, we're looking at why everything is good. This stuff is still there. So this stuff's not going away. And again, yeah. If we're the forbearance housing bros here, the housing crash bros, then you know this is this is real real life. Okay, uh, I don't buy into the bubble theory or continual of bubble theory from the housing hype uh, dudes. All right, simple as that. So what else is going on? Well, hey, and I and again I talked about this at my last video, um, and now this says it right here. So you know there were some articles that were written in the previous uh, my previous video about the fact that. Um, look, you know, again, the housing crash bros here, or the housing forbearance bros, you know, um, the, the, our narrative has fallen apart because of all these forbearances. Like this, there was a big drop in forbearance here, right? So steep drop in forbearance rate logged as loans exit the CARES Act plans. And I talked about that as well, but I want to I want to emphasize this right now. Um, so yes, we see what, you know, like this is this critical time from end of September, early October was when a lot of uh, people in forbearance were coming out of their initial six month plans. All right. So, so when they pop out of the plans, it's going to say, oh my goodness, we're taking a look at that chart, a giant step down. And again, when we go into the narrative, it's like, oh, you know, we, you know, the pessimists, the housing crash bros, um, you know, we're negative and, it, you know, our, our theories, our perspective, our concepts are getting blown in the water here because look, look at all these people coming out of forbearance and that means that everything is good and they're back making a mortgage payments. That means they're getting jobs or getting money, whatever that is. That's fabulous. Okay, well, not the case here. And we're going to debunk this right now. Uh, not the case here because even though mortgage forbearance rate falls to a lowest level since mid-April, Okay, that's fabulous from, again, a headline hunter perspective. Look at my right arrow. It says, federally backed loans under the CARES Act are eligible to be extended for up to 12 months, but borrowers must contact their servicer for an extension. Without that contact, borrowers exit forbearance, whether they are delinquent or current on their loan. That's the whole point here, all right, is the fact that if I come out of forbearance and you know I'm, I'm out on Monday, and they make the statistic, and I don't call my lender for a week or two or whatever, um, and they pull the stats, or well, they, they tend to run the stats on a Thursday. Well, at least that's when they publish them. 
uh, and we see where on the weekly change. Well, guess what? That's why I say this is a false piece of information because if you know four or five hundred thousand people, like it dropped something like that, it dropped you know from about three point six to about two point nine. So we're taking a look at about six hundred thousand people was the drop from you know that they were talking about. And I'm kind of going, okay, great. You know, I don't I don't see that many people just suddenly going, great. Our forbearance is over. I'm back to making my normal monthly mortgage payments. Off we go. We don't know at this point in time yet how many of those people are. Number one, paid off their house and sold it. Number two, refied. Number three, um, got back on track and can now make their monthly mortgage payments. Or four, um, uh, can't and now they've contacted their lender for for additional loss mitigation um, solutions or just haven't called their lender to get back up on the plan again. Because once your six months is over, you can get back into an additional six month plan if you want. So I just want to be clear here that this is, that's the good piece of information. And the stats that we see in the headlines are misleading. And that's why things are not as good as it seems. Simple as that. And, and why do I say so? Well, look, mortgages will experience an elevated level of distress through 2021. Okay. And you know, there's a little chart there about, you know, the loans that have left the COVID-19 forbearance plans. And you can see that some were paid off. Most of them are, are performing. Okay. Some are delinquent and active in loss mit, and some are not in loss mit. Loss mitigation mean the fact that they're doing nothing about it. All right. We also know there's a million plus other uh, delinquent loans out there under no forbearance plan, and they're just going to plod along and eventually hitting the foreclosure bucket process. All right. So again, um, this is the narrative here. It, it, the, the, my narrative or the narrative on the housing crash bros is the fact that things aren't as good when you start looking at, at the information. You don't jump to conclusions uh, based on looking at articles right away. All right. I always take a day or two now not to jump on things. And and what, what, how does I how do I support that? Well, look. Uh, 100 in July, 120 delinquencies were double the Great Recession peak. So if we take a look at the serious delinquencies, okay, are at a six-year high. So delinquencies, uh, like like when you're um, 30 days down, you're delinquent from your mortgage. When you're you know at 90 to 120 days and greater, you're now considered seriously delinquent. And we all know, or at least in the housing industry, we know that the farther or the more delinquent you are the tougher it is to bring your loan current and or to stay out of uh, other issues as going for primarily foreclosure stuff. All right. So the whole point here is that, you know, we're seeing, oh, everything is great on one hand. Oh, but but you know what? The data is not correlating. You can have high housing values. And that's, that's again, that's how we've got this weird K-shaped um, housing market going on because some markets are increasing, some stuff's doing great. And this, even though it's stacking and behind the scenes, it hasn't hit yet. And that's coming in a while. So this is it's a it's a artificially controlled market that gives everybody a false sense of security for sure. All right, uh, Core Logic. Now, why am I liking Core Logic these days? And quite frankly, um, you know, I just think that they're they're becoming a little more balanced in, in what they're producing. And so this again, this is through July. And realize that the, the the difference though that or not the difference, but the situation. You know, on the forbearance side, we're looking at almost real time numbers apparently. All right, because again, there there is I think as I mentioned before, you know, it's it's extrapolation of data that they're you know trying to figure out where things are at on an overall basis, which which I do believe they're either off or they're conservative, or, or the, the low low they're underestimating or, or low estimating for sure. CoreLogic, though, from a home value perspective, and now this loan performance insights. Now they're a couple months behind, so here we are. We're in October right now, mid mid to later towards late of October. Yet they're going through their July data. So of course we've got two full months of data that they're you know that we're just behind, kind of like Case Shiller, because CoreLogic does control Case Shiller as well too. But the point I'm trying to make here is the fact that you know um, we're seeing where things are at. So this is a you know the chief economist for CoreLogic four months into the pandemic. The 120-day delinquency rate for July spiked to 1.4%. This was the highest rate in more than 21 years and double the December 2009 Great Recession peak. The spike in delinquency was all the more stunning given the generational low of 0.01% in March. So this is the thing. So the, the pandemic, the, the, the non-payments, you know, the whole bit um, it really sp spiked. And the interesting thing is that it was in such a short period of time. That's why we know there's going to be problems because the volume just came out of the blue here. So you've got the economists for CoreLogic saying, you know, it's a, there's problems here. Um, 30 days or more delinquent national, we could see that 
the, the national delinquency rate was 3.8 percent a year ago. In July of this year, was 6.6 6 percent. So it, it grew, you know, fairly substantial on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, we take a look at other information that they have here: uh, recession impact on loan performance. So clearly, you can see that certain states, so the share of un un unemployment claims, um, you know, through July 2020 and the overall delinquency rates. So you can see that certain states um, just have, you know, are, are getting higher delinquency rates. So Nevada, New Jersey, New York, Hawaii, and Florida, and they're, they're trying to show us the share of unemployment claims. So is there a correlation there? Um, it looks like, you know, um, well, I mean, obviously the high, I'm, I'm sure the higher the, the unemployment, the, the more delinquencies we have, but I, I don't really see a, I mean, New Jersey is almost the same. Obviously Nevada's, you know, higher uh, with claims. Uh, so is New York and so is Hawaii. So we'll see how that plays out over the, over the next couple of months. But, you know, the point is that these guys are looking at it and they're trying to find some sort of, you know, rationale. Um, many Americans, particularly millennials, are taking advantage of low rates to either purchase their first home or upgrade their living situation. However, given the unsteadiness of the job market, many homeowners are beginning to feel the compounding pressures of unstable income and debt on personal savings buffers creating heightened risk of falling behind in their mortgages. So these guys see it. And that's the whole type of thing that we need to get into is the fact that, you know, uh, and I mentioned that on my, my sort of, you know, top one of my top 10 reason videos for housing uh, crisis uh, and crash is it's because like the lenders see this stuff. So they get the data, they can see it actually happening and they can see problems arising in advance before we get the peg counts of foreclosures or things um, you know, down the road a few months, all right? So just realize that. Loan performance, again, this is based on core logic. You can see that delinquencies up, and you can see that the, the farther delinquencies, like your 120 days, your 90 days, um, are starting to increase now. Um, you know, 90 to 119 days, 120 plus days are, are increasing. The, um, for, the, the, the far right column is the foreclosures. Well, they're not increasing because nobody's filing them all right so that's the reason why again no courts filing foreclosures or very few are because there's no point uh transitional rates so you can certainly see that um you know the bottom people who were delinquent you know um 30 to 60 days are increasing 60 to 90 days are increasing big time it's almost doubling you see so that's where we know that we're getting a significant amount of of, of people entering that more critical stage of delinquencies we take a look at delinquencies across the board. Basically, every state in the country has had an increase in delinquency. So uh, it's green for decrease, gray for no change, red for increase. Well, guess what? Uh, there's Everything's red there, all right? So, so every state has seen an increase in serious delinquency. So no state is, we'll call it, um, you know, I guess you say immune from what's going on right now. The seriously delinquency state as of July, we can see the New York, New Jersey, Louisiana, Florida, Nevada, Connecticut, Hawaii, Maryland, Mississippi, Georgia. So a lot of those are are what I'm going to call your typical states that have um, you know foreclosure and delinquency issues from the last housing crisis. So a, a lot of again, New York, New, New Jersey, Louisiana, Florida, Nevada, Connecticut a bit, Hawaii yes, Maryland yep, uh, Georgia as well too, Mississippi. All those were you know they were up in the top ten to fifteen for sure last housing crisis. We'll probably see them there as well. Um, if we go into the seriously delinquent metropolitan areas, all right, you can see that, you know, out of the metro areas, you know, 382 metro areas where serious delinquency rates increased, there were two metropolitan areas where the serious delinquency rate remained the same or decreased, okay? So basically, you know, states are going up and virtually every metro location has seen an increase in serious delinquency. So as I said, it's affecting all areas of the country. All right. Certain delinquency rates, your 10 largest uh, areas are the Boston area, Chicago area, Denver area, Houston, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, New York, uh, Newark, New Jersey, uh, San Fran, Oakland area, Washington, uh, Arlington, Alexandria area. So uh, again, you know, and this is again the July rate. So I would expect that we're going to see more as time goes on. Uh, you know, again, I look at it going, the more people that are extending their forbearances certainly mean that they're going longer and deeper in delinquency. So we're going to see these serious delinquency rates go up. Simple as that. All right. So that's the scoop on this. And, you know, again, what's the point I'm trying to make here? Um, well, I think the point is it's going back to the narrative. When I, you know, when I see things that, you know, and again, like, do, do not get me wrong here. I mean, 
I want a healthy housing market. All right. I just, I'm trying to be, more, I think I'm more of a realist, especially with what I was doing, you know, in the last housing crisis, seeing how it unfolded, seeing what went on. And there's only so much convincing that we can do to ourselves via the media, the, the housing hype people to say, hey, everything is good because we know that there's low inventory. We know that people are getting tapped out. We know that there's economic issues. We know that there's more shutdowns. We know that there's 64 million initial jobless claims that came out. We know there's a lot of stuff going on that will start to manifest itself in the future because of eviction moratoriums, foreclosure sale moratoriums, uh, lack of foreclosure starts, uh, lack of foreclosure current case processing. We're not seeing stuff flow now. So it's like it is the the real estate market is being controlled once again, um, you know, from a different perspective, which is is putting the upward pressure on price points, you know, etc. I think we can all see that. So that's that's kind of my point here, guys. Um, don't get a false sense of where the housing market's headed. You know, we've got the information from CoreLogic. We got the information from Adam Data Solutions. We see the other stuff from National Mortgage News that I showed up there. The fact that there's still, you know, uh, forbearance is, you know, the, the success in forbearance is because people haven't decided what to do yet after their, their initial, you know, plans over. So, again, when, when we jump the gun and say everything is great, that's to, that to me is problematic and doesn't help anybody. You know, we have to be realistic here. All right. Um, as I summarize, we have two housing narratives in play here, right? K-shaped housing market. You need to understand your market. And, and why I say that is the fact that, you know, large cities like in New York City are seeing mass exodus, like a San Fran, like a Chicago. Yet people are moving out of the cities and they're buying up in the burbs. And, you know, like in New York, people are going to Connecticut. I was just reading that there's a location in Connecticut that, that's, you know, having a great time with real estate right now because they're receiving people selling or leaving the city coming out to the burbs. So we're going to see some of that shift. So it's it's really wealth transfer, it's buying power transfer. People are selling, you know, moving moving out. Um, we're also starting to see in some of the mega cities like in New York and like in San Fran, we're seeing uh, rental rates also dropping big time. So once again, people are moving, that means more houses are available, uh, which means people are might might go I don't need to rent here anymore. And and this and the same thing with respect to uh, price points. I mean, you know, whether you rent or I mean, we know that a lot of companies are saying you can work from home now. So in, in some of these locations, there may not be a need to pay premium for either uh, home ownership or, or rental accommodation to live close to the to your work or office that's not required in the future. So we're going to see a shift on two levels there. So why does this why am I talking about this? Well, what's going to help this is when all these um, this this shadow inventory that is starting to stack up and starting to bulge and kind of, you know, get under pressure like a geyser or a, or a volcano, eventually that stuff's going to hit the market. It's going to be distressed, off-market stuff, you know, becoming available. Uh, you got to get into that. That's where you're going to get the best priced properties, the best deals. And I can tell you, your average real estate agent won't do this for you. So people who are looking, you know, I get a lot of inquiries, people saying, hey, can you help me find something? Well, you know what? I can, but it's going to go, we're going to go down a different path here because not like I'm looking in the MLS going, oh, look at all these distressed properties. I'm going to happily show you and you're going to buy for discounts. They don't exist because they're not on market. They're under the radar. That's why we call it the shadow inventory. All right. So something you got to take more, you probably got to take some more interest in your real estate future. So you need to contact me for a consultation to find out what I'm talking about. Different methods to acquire property, different ways of doing it. Um, certainly drop me a line and we'll talk uh, clearly. Give me your name. Email me. There's my email right there. Put, give me your phone number. I'm catching up with a lot of people this week. But the point is, you know, this is just we're in limbo. The market is is uh, kind of on hold now. Uh, a lot of things are going on. I realize that. Uh, we'll probably see, you know, some changes, to, you know, after November here. Uh, if the moratoriums are lifted, we're going to see some more activity. But I'm starting to see more things kind of shake out now. Uh, and the distressed properties are, are, are becoming more available. And as I said, we have different ways of how we approach uh, on acquisition on these things. All right. Give me a shout, guys. Anyway, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate the views, likes, and comments. If you're not already a subscriber, please help my channel grow. Hit the subscribe button. Share the video with your family and friends. We'll look forward to speaking with you. And later on this week, see ya.